So welcome to this episode of Menopause Conversations. My name is Amantha King and I'm delighted, really delighted to have my next guest with me today. I'd like to introduce you to the fabulous force to be reckoned with that is Kate Duffy. Hello, Kate. How are you? Hello. How are you? <laughs> I'm fine. Give us a flash of your T-shirt. Hey, you need to say something else then. I know. I know. So here Keep we go. Keep your T-shirt on. It's not make, that kind of show. Make, make menopause, menopause matter. matter. Now, why does that matter? Let me tell you. So whenever I'm doing these, Kate, I nearly always wear my T-shirt. And today's the one day I didn't wear it because actually you're wearing it. And there's a symbolism in that because Kate Duffy is actually the person who created those T-shirts for the Make Menopause Matter campaign that was started by Diane Dansbrink, who we've also had on as a guest. And um, what is absolutely wonderful is that, Kate, you are one of the original grassroots supporters um, who got this all going. Um, and the rest of us have happily joined along like Pied Pipers um, because you, you, you put the wheels in motion around this. So tell us a little bit about you. Tell us a little bit about how you got involved with the Make Menopause matter campaign um and we'll just see where our conversation goes so so would you yes. okay I'll, I'll try and like boil it down I've worked okay. here for 24 hours instead of one <laughs> so about it's got to be getting on for 10 years ago I started getting lots of symptoms that I knew uh, that, that were new so um, hair loss, um, achy joints, I was in the doctors with countless UTIs, um, tinnitus, itchy skin, anxiety, palpitations, insomnia, um, depression, low mood. And I was constantly be, being told, we, we send you to the uh, specialists. So I, was, I was just being referred to the hospital over and over again and going around in circles with a GP. Now, in the end, I was thinking I was getting so desperate because it wasn't being addressed. I was just being given antidepressants, which I can't take. I have an intolerance to. Therefore, that sent me to another specialist that was, and they were just focusing on finding an antidepressant that I could take rather than thinking of other causes that fitted in with the other symptoms. Um, and I and I in the end, I just Googled it like you do, because I'm getting desperate at this point. I'm, you know, I can't sleep. I've, I've got kids to look after. I'm a single parent of three. Um, one, the boys, Archie's got ADHD and autism. Holly is also a PMDD a diagnosed, which is premenstrual dysphoric disorder, but we can come back to that. And um, Delilah has also got symptoms of it. And there's only me and I have no extended family. So I, this was, I was seriously getting buried alive with everything. I googled these symptoms and menopause came up and I looked at the other symptoms and I, it was me it was me you might as well put my photo next to all these symptoms I thought that is me went back into the GP I said could this be menopause no you're too young I was 44 at the time 43 maybe 44 and I thought no I'm not this, this is menopause so I from there I had a fight with the GP's to get a diagnosis for menopause. And the struggle just went on and on and on. And when I was Googling menopause, I came across the Make Menopause Matter campaign. And then I looked at that and I thought, my God, Diane Danterbrink, who had um, surgical menopause, had the same trouble as me. So she's gone into overnight menopause, hit her like a ton of bricks. Her story was just horrendous. She had no support, nowhere to turn. And I just thought that she started that campaign as a result of that. And it was out of my desperation for treatment and care and diagnosis that I then sort of contacted Diane and said, oh my God, I'm so glad I found you and the support site and the Facebook page. And then it was just, it became like, I've got to support this woman. I've, I've got to be involved in this campaign. I've got to support this campaign because I had the same difficulties and I was just being buried alive by symptoms and not being heard. So that's how they, they linked up. So my fight, I would go to Diane for advice and she'd tell me what to do and how to get the doctors to listen, yada, yada, like we all know now it's on lots of sites of what to do. Um, and then I started up an Instagram account 
which was already running actually, but oh. I did start it as the tongue in cheek. It was called Men O Maeve, tongue in cheek it was. This is before I got savaged by the symptoms. This is at the beginning. So it was already running, but then it really switched from being tongue in cheek to uh, quite serious. I really regret I called myself Men O Maeve at this point. Oh. But it's too late because the account was already set up and running. So then I became um, like a, everything that Diane would, would do, I would repost. I was very involved in um, Facebook reposting, contacting with Diane, went along to Diane speaking. Um, and that's how the relationship formed, really. Yeah, it's really wonderful. So if I add in how I sort of became aware of that. So um, I just remembered sort of putting together some stuff about um, menopause for Menopause Awareness Day a couple of years ago. And I sort of like doing my research, seeing who else was in this space, because I was just trotting along myself corporately talking to people on a one to one about menopause. Um, and I just remember, like so many other people, seeing a sea of white T-shirts that day in Parliament Square with Make Menopause Matter. And I was like, what? what is that? You know, and I can remember just seeing all this army of amazing women. Um, Davina McCall was also wearing one of your T-shirts, which was absolutely amazing. Um, you know, because the point is, you were the grassroots supporters that created that change that that got menopause on the agenda, you know, three distinct aims about education, you know, better awareness in schools, um, actually on the curriculum and in the workplace as well. So we've, we've nailed one of those already. And so so it's because of people like you joining forces with Diane that actually this campaign, which has what is it? It's over 177,000 signatures now. Yeah. I repeat that, 177,000. It's got to be one of the largest petitions and campaigns going that has this much awareness, doesn't it? Yeah, it's been going since 2018. Yeah. So way before the Davina um, documentary, but that propelled menopause into the mainstream. Um, but the campaign has been going since 2018. That's when um, Diane launched it. And I started um really sort of looking for help in 2018 it was so that's when I came across it It just started and I I sort of joined on the bandwagon a couple of months after that just at just at the and right I, time and thank yeah. goodness you you did because I love watching um Kate on Instagram we'll give out all your socials um at the end but um you are brilliant because you just say it like it is with a with a rawness and an honesty that I think so many of your followers um, appreciate because it's not great, is it? If you are one in, in one of those one in four that it's horrific for. I definitely consider yeah. myself to be one of those one in four and I've been perimenopausal for 14 years, you know, and behind all the smile, behind all the professionalism, people just have no idea what it's no. like to pull yourself together on a daily basis because we're not complaining and we're not moaning but we're just turning up so so tell us then how then you became involved with PMDD so how did that progress in your life because if it wasn't bad enough with with menopause and all the complexities that you have to deal with with your children and their, and, and their own needs this thing appears in your life called PMDD so yeah how did that turn up because I'm a I'm a bit of a fighter anyway, thank God. I mean, I have to fight, otherwise I get I wouldn't get any help. When I finally got some treatment for menopause, it wasn't working, and Ooh. it was then we discovered ah, it, I'm a bit more complicated than we thought. So I was referred, which I had to beg to for the referral to the local hospital has a menopause specialist clinic in it. So I begged my GP for this referral, who they said didn't, by the way, they said the clinic, there wasn't one, it didn't exist. Even though my doctor's surgery shares the grounds of the hospital. Oh, so no. I said, look out the window, it's there. Oh, no. Anyway, that's another story. That's, that's when I was actually crying on, if you saw the clip of me on the Davina documentary, the first one, I'm crying. That's me finally getting the doctors to refer me. So I go over to the specialist menopause clinic and see the specialist and it, it's having conversations with the specialist there. They said that they thought I had um, a PMDD. And I was thinking, hang on a minute, PMDD is what I've read up before, 
because my daughter suffers with cyclical really bad mood I mean sort of serious bad mood suicidal thoughts and all sorts and I've researched that before and this PMDD had come up and we saw, I said to Holly before this looks like you but then the specialist said it to me she said looking at your um, symptoms it sounds like you have premenstrual dysphoric disorder and I'm like but what is that exactly? And they said, it's the sensitivity to your own flu hormone fluctuations. So you, you just can't handle your, your the fluctuating of your hormones in the luteal phase. So after ovulation, for that 14 days up to when you start your bleed, when there's some serious fluctuating going on, that's when you will get all your symptoms coming in. And, I, and it is, that was it. We were like, oh my God, that has been me since I would say, 16. Wow. And I've been in and out of the doctors with low mood, insomnia, um, all these symptoms for years and years, decades. I've been in and out of the doctors, and not one GP had mentioned premenstrual dysphoric disorder. And everything just clicked into place. And then we were like, oh my God, Holly, that's you as well. That's my 32 year old. She went to the GP because we, then we were just like the Make Menopause Matter campaign. There's lots of um, PMDD sites as well yes. to go to, yes. the IAPMD, the Lunar Hub. You go onto those and they do the same thing. They tell you how to go to the doctor, take your symptoms, do a, a diary to show it's cyclical, yes. take your symptom list in, take your nice guidelines in. We did all that. And Holly was diagnosed and was referred to the Chelsea and Westminster within sort of six months because she, hers is on another level to mine even. And she, you know, she's only 32, so I don't want her to live with it. So that's how we discovered PMDD. Wow. So then we launched the PMDD represented campaign. Um, and because I've got experience of being around Diane, and, and that campaign, we went along the same lines because yeah, education at school is, is paramount. So you can recognize what it is and, and you know get onto it straight away. Also, um, the GPs need training because once again, there is no GP training for premenstrual dysphoric disorder. And once again, sort of one in, one in 20 women can have it and it's half the population of women and um, support in the workplace. So we went along the same lines Ooh. as those. Um, we launched that in January and we also have the petition running as well, but we're on Instagram under PMD. Well, we'll definitely put the link for that because the, the more signatures, the better. So if I can come back to that, because it's really important, isn't it? Um, particularly with PMDD. I mean, do you have any figures around what the incidence is? I mean, we know that, you know, sort of premature menopause, it can be, you know, one, one in a thousand, one in a hundred, you know, under 30 can have a premature menopause. Do we know any stats around? Yeah, there are PMDD? stats, but don't ask me on the top. I, I'm not. <laughs> well, we know, this we just know because now people know more, you're less like, it's not about give you an antidepressant, is it? it? It's a trigger for people to go, actually, could this be? PMDD because if we've got girls starting their periods earlier and earlier and earlier it absolutely should be something that parents know about school should know about yes CPs should know about shouldn't they so well I, I was able to spot it in Delilah who's 15 now but I spotted it in her as soon as she was like 13 14 wow. and we were aware of it we could see it in Delilah like she would it, before her period she would literally change personality her face would have a different expression I swear to you she just looked like a different child and me and Holly were both like uh-oh yeah we, this is not looking good for her either because she is got, goes introvert she goes she's emote she has the worst night terrors dreams your mental dreams that you can have with PMDD is unreal she was talking about all these dreams that left her feeling out of sorts the next day she'd be crying over nothing and just just no motivation and we thought this is it we could spot it already and um we were able to go to the doctors with that knowledge yeah and and talk to the gp about it and luckily because my gp is aware of it now because of myself my gp was able to, to say oh okay let's um treat her and and see what we can do for her as well 
it's, so it's that it, knowledge yes and that is you know it's that old adage isn't it knowledge is power and it does give you you know you you become that empowered person sitting in front of a, a gp you know yeah. because they don't know everything yeah. they are a generalist they're not a specialist yeah you, you become that person and and so if i can ask you um a couple of things i mean i'm definitely very very progesterone sensitive um i was just i was described once by an hrt specialist as difficult to manage which is oh, always nice. helpful isn't it um but the point was you know your body don't you and if it's if it's because you've been on contraception it's because you've been on hrt do not be put off if it doesn't feel right for you it doesn't feel right but can you tell us is it the problem with the estrogen is it the problem with the progesterone or is it just like you say just this subtle dropping of one rising of another is, is is there more of a sensitivity with pmdd to one or both it's both this is what they they know at the moment because once again it's very no lack of funding lack of research but what how it's going at the moment is it's both it's the fluctuation but you can have a progesterone intolerance on top of that yeah. so I've also got a progesterone intolerance. So not only have I got PMDD, I've got a progesterone intolerance. The Holly's got a progesterone intolerance, which then affects the treatments. Yes. Which was which was coming out actually um, when I was taking my HRT, when I was using the progesterone side of the treatment, because I had a womb at this point, I was just going in, I was nose diving into the trenches of, of depression. And then it would go again. And we were like, hang on, this is getting worse every time I use progesterone. Right. So it was then it was the specialist said, we think you also have a progesterone intolerance. And was it all so progesterone? Is it, is it, is it, I mean, because we must just say to people as well, progesterone is not the same as progesterone. No. Progesterone is chemical, isn't it, in, in, yeah. in its format, whereas progesterone is actually things like eutrogestan. They're the the body identical yes. hormones. So we, did you fare better with either no, of those? Both, both. Exactly the same. Exactly the same. And it didn't matter how I used it. So I used it orally, you know, the eutrogestin. Yes. I used it because I was with a specialist. I was allowed to use it vaginally. It, it still affected me. But also Holly, when she had a um, Mirena, 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 oh God, coil yeah. put in, she had the most horrendous reaction to it so i did see her oil. video actually on instagram yes. and i just felt and she said she just wanted that thing out yeah because all she wanted to do was throw us out of the flat window so that's how she felt it, it, it was it was just horrendous and that was from a coil but we must stress that this isn't everybody no. people have coils and they're it works brilliantly for them so we, we we're just unlucky i think if you're that way inclined, you've got PMDD, there is a likelihood you could be progesterone sensitive. I, I think that's how I, it goes. I would, agree, I would agree with you. When I went yeah. on um, a progesterone, it was actually for sk my skin, actually. I had really bad acne. I, I'm estrogen dominant as well, just to throw that into the mix. Um, and, and so they were really limited what they could give me. And they gave me something called Dianet. Well, honestly, I rang my specialist whilst I was on holiday and went, you need to get me off this because it's dark. I'd, you know, it was really, and I'd never felt like that before. I remember being in Scotland with my family on, on our holiday and just thinking something bad's going to happen here. Yes. That's the feeling that, of doom. An impending sense of doom. Yes. And it's like you are in this bubble of doom and everyone's disconnected from yes. it. There's a barrier of doom around you. And everyone's doing their thing and getting on with stuff and you'll just feel like you're separated from it all. Completely. It's like the heaviest heart, isn't it, you've got? It's it, like, oh, my God. And, and then the guilt all comes. You know, I'm like, oh, this is our holiday and I'm being an absolute nightmare. Like, yeah, I could see it in myself, but felt powerless to do anything about it. And I just remember just ringing and going, right, I'm stopping it. And I'm telling you, I need something else because this is awful. And yet... When I'd taken it in my 20s, it wasn't awful. And so yeah. it's this whole complex thing that who we were in our 20s is not who we are in our 40s and 50s. And I think that was the hardest thing to get my head around, which is I'm changing. Nothing's staying the same. Every every day is going to be different, which in itself is a head spinner. Um, 
but I'm going to try and do the, do the best I can. So, so obviously that wasn't the end for you though, was it? And, and then you went on to talk about other things that you've had to have done quite recently. So do you want to tell sort of people how, yeah. how it sort of progressed even further? So it was a bit of a balls up, uh, a bit of a balls up, over, it was a bit of an <laughs> overs up really, because I had a history, I had a, uh, I won't call it, a hist- well it is a hysterectomy, I had my womb removed. Yes. My ovaries left in okay. 2019 and then was literally diagnosed with PMDD a couple of months after. Oh. So if we'd have known that, we'd have took my ovaries out at that point, because if you can't ovulate, you shouldn't be getting PMDD. So that it could have all come out at the same time. Oh. But the conflict for me was, oh, no, don't take my I was so petrified that I would crash into surgical menopause because I was already suffering with the menopause symptoms from just going through it and my estrogen levels depleting naturally. I was terrified what was going to happen if you took my ovaries. So we agreed we'd leave my ovaries, just take my womb out because my bleeding was out of control, just flooding. And there's nothing could control that either. Um, We left my ovaries in. So, which meant I didn't have to take the progesterone. So that was a good thing. Okay. Because I had no womb to protect. So I was estrogen only at this point. So we took that progesterone element out of it. And then when I was PMDD diagnosed, because I I was still saying, I feel absolutely horrendous. And, you know, before before what would be maybe a period, because I'm still ovulating, because I've still yeah. got ovaries, but it's really hard to track at this point. Yeah. Because you're not got, you can't time it with a period. But I knew that that every month I was feeling like shit in that dark doom and gloom place, and it was just getting worse and worse. So after trying, they put me on progesterone, back on progesterone daily to try and stop fluctuations, which causes. PMDD put me on progesterone to 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 back counterbalance the estrogen. Well, just went off the Richter scale with the progesterone intolerance. So we knew that wasn't going to be a a form of um, treatment. Then we tried the implant, where you have a chemical sort of shutdown of the ovaries. That didn't agree with me either. I had the most horrendous side effects for that. I mean. It, I had water retention and stuff, but physically I was thinking, oh, well, I can deal with being a water buffalo. But I also felt horrendous as well. It just didn't, it didn't do anything. It no. didn't help. So what no. was the point? So after three or four months of that, we decided enough was enough with that. Um, and then we tried increasing estrogen, using lots of estrogen. We tried dropping estrogen. And in the end, I said, Uh, One of these specialists said, we should just take your ovaries out. Let's just take your ovaries out because that will stop you ovulating and that will deal with the PMDD side of things. Then we can just focus on the menopause side. And then I had my ovaries out in January this year. And that's when we launched and decided, right, we need to start a campaign for PMDD because this is ridiculous. I'm 54 and I'm just having my ovaries out to remedy PMDD that, you know, could have been addressed years ago and Holly was sat opposite me she still has awful trouble because she can't get hold of the specialist clinic at a drop of a hat she has to wait for her appointment and the appointment half the time they don't ring it's chaos I have to ring pals make a complaint it's so hard so yeah I tried lots of treatments oh and also the first line treatment for PMDD are antidepressants which is fine. And it works for some women. It really does. They take their antidepressants and it helps with their PMDD symptoms. Not for me and Holly. We cannot take antidepressants. If you give us an antidepressant, we crash. We go even deeper and lower than we were in the first place. So they're off the table. So we really are at the end of the, as your specialist called, a difficult spectrum. We are really complicated. We really do need specialist treatment. But we are worst case scenario. Yeah. So I don't want to frighten women about, you know, are we, oh, if we can't take progesterone and stuff. What if we can't take antidepressants? My sister takes them, antidepressants, and is happy as a pig in poo. No side effects. She won't be without them. That's what keeps her, 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 her level. That's, you know. So I, if I could take them, I would. 
And it's and it is important that, isn't it? Because genetically, that's I think probably what it sort of comes down to, isn't it? You know, the genetics, how that plays out in your life. I mean, I know that my history, I've got two sisters, I'm the middle one. Guess what? We're all exactly the same. Really heavy periods, really estrogen dominant. My sister had endometriosis, which was undiagnosed since her teenage years, had to have surgery, stoma. You know, I didn't, I wasn't as bad as that. Um, but along those sorts of lines, and my sister is exactly the same. And so mm. we do need a, a, a larger pool of specialists, don't we, that can that can deal with women. I mean, I know the University College London Hospital is amazing. My sister's surgeon was phenomenal. And I say to anybody, if you've got a gynae or women's health issue, that is the place to go because you can self-refer. And I don't know if lots of people know that, you know, if you can pay the fare to travel to that hospital, which you shouldn't have to, but if you're desperate, you can self-refer anywhere in the country and they will take you because it's part of the National Health Service. And it's part, part of the patient's charter. You can go wherever you need to go to get the treatment, but we shouldn't have to. And I mean, it just sounds to me when I hear you say all of these things, it's sort of like we're, we're just being tinkered with, aren't we? Try yeah. this. Don't try that. Try this. Try this, As well as keep going with your life. And yeah. we already know that a million women have left work and I wanted to talk to you about that in terms of the impact because it can be very sort of like oh this is just about you and we're talking about it very casually but it, it isn't it doesn't just affect you does it it affects no everything around you so can yeah. you tell people what was the impact on you know your work you know so I think when I after I had my second um two children I had them a bit later in life and I think things got really a lot worse hormonally after I had those two, two children, one at 35 and one at 37. It was already bad before, and then I think it got worse. I ended up splitting up with the, with the father of those, and I became a single mum, and they were two and four. And I, I was in an absolute state by then. And um, so I was having these PMDD um, episodes every month, um, and I, I just couldn't go to work. I, I, I was got a job in um, the hospital actually, and I was absolutely overwhelmed by it. I couldn't even remember how to log on. I felt inadequate. I felt like I couldn't learn anything new. I'd lost any sort of skills. I'd worked in a university for eight to nine years. So I was, I did have skills of using the computers and, you know, and but I just couldn't do it. And I, it scared me and I, the brain fog, um, but with PMDD, it's hard to even move out of the bed. You know, you just lay there. You just lay there frozen in that bubble of doom and gloom. So I thought, I, I didn't know what to do. And I was now a single mum of a two and a four year old. I had a partner that was had addiction problems with heroin and, and um, crack. So it was all going on. And uh, actually, I, I don't know why I did this, but I decided to go to university and do a um, degree. Okay. Wow. I did a, that's when I did the degree for writing. I did a degree in writing wow. for performance because I thought I've worked in, I can't work in there and I need to do something. I don't know what I was thinking. Anyway, I did this degree. And then after that, and passed. I got a distinction as well, but this that's the imposter syndrome. I think they felt that sorry is, for me. Um, Single mum, it's given Oh a my gosh. Well, honestly, yes. I don't know how I did why or how I did that. And then I thought, right, I've got to go to work. I've got to go to work. And um, I, I knew I couldn't go into a, a job like that. I didn't feel I was fit enough to do it. So I thought I'd do, I'll go self-employed. And all my friends were like, for God's sakes, woman, you, you paint our furniture for us. Start up a, a furniture painting business. And I was like, I can't, I'm not good enough. I'm not worthy to be paid. That self-doubt, low self-worth again, eating into you as a result of PMDD for years. And then I thought, well, I've got to because Who's going to take the kids to school, pick them up? I've got to manage my own diary. I've got to be able to be, to be able to, if I can't make it into work that day, I don't have to. I can manage my own work. I can choose who I work to. I can choose. So I was kind of forced into um, furniture painting. So I did that for nine years. And then a year and a half ago, maybe just under that, myself and, and Holly decided we'd make t-shirts to raise awareness for women's health so like the make menopause yeah. 
I did one and it said, all I want for Christmas is my HRT. And we used the, uh, the you know, we played on I the clever. words. And then we said, well, why don't we just do this as a business? And that's when we started Duffy's Quips. Because then, because Holly was also finding it hard to commit to going to work nine to five every day. She, she just couldn't do it because of the PMDD. So we started Duffy's Quips. And um, that is more of an enterprise than a business. So we campaigned for Maggie Oliver with, you know, with the, with the grooming of the kids, um, the girls. We do the Make Menopause Matter campaign. We support that. We do our own. Um, what else we do we do? We, we support the, the, uh, the IAPMD. We, we back them as well. So it's all about raising awareness, supporting, empowering, and encourage you know just encouraging women to to make the best of what they can do with what they've got. But we're, we're like we feel like Dale Boy Trotter and Rodney. But oh, you're so much more than that. You're so much more. But they were lovable characters too, really. And we we all resonated with with Dale Boy and Rodney. And there's a reason for that. And I think that's what you do on social media. People resonate with you. Love your little your little um, pieces to camera that you do in your car um I'm a little you, rant when you have a little rant and yeah. and then you put the world to rights you go okay then bye and yeah. you, so, so, it's, so it's, it's all good in the world and I think so many of us relate to that because this there feels like so much injustice for women but what I yeah. recognize through all these conversations I have with women is that there's strength in this adversity you know it's no mean feat to set up an enterprise a business it's no mean feat to go to university get a distinction those things are all all in you whether or not you have pmdd but i think pmdd menopause opens the door for you to 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 literally deploy that as your superpower and so you know you luck doesn't come into it you know what is it you, you make your own luck you make it by doing the things that you've talked about it might have been a survival instinct. It might have been something like that, but you did it and you continue to do it. And you're doing it on behalf of those that can't find their voice or don't know how to find their voice. So, so I mean, before we started recording, you told me you did a bit of writing, but you didn't tell me that big bomb that you just dropped there. I mean, I mean that, you know, <sighs> what would you like to do with your writing? Is there something you feel that you could do to sort of take it to the next level? combining with your awareness because you are you're a great orator you're a great singer as well I notice have you done have you done singing god no no you're no no, no you're no, an amazing no. voice you do loads no. of little singy songy bits which I adore I think gosh you must have been a singer that's the ADHD and we're always singing the whole house I know I noticed that about Holly I mean you and Holly could be sisters more than mother mother and daughter but yeah, Archie is very similar to us as well he's, is he's he? like a, a male 17 year old version yeah he's you always like you should have been at something. the Platinum Jubilee, giving it large, giving it... Every, everyone says we should have um, a reality show of our own, like the Kardashians. Oh, I, would tune, I would tune in, because you know what? More than anything, I think you would definitely show us the highs and lows and everything in between. I think it would be... I think we need something like that, a menopause reality. Well, if, if I was to do any watching, writing... Channel 4 are watching. I, if I if we did any writing, I would write about my life probably but you know obviously do make it a bit of drama but the, the amount of drama that has gone on in this house is unreal the walls could and talk if the walls could talk and it would relate to 32 year olds 54 year olds 17 year olds it would cover the whole so if I was to write anything it would be um yeah just about the journey that we've all been through with ADHD PMDD menopause and how it impacts on the household but I can't write comedy I'd have oh, to be so I, good. you I don't do... need to though you just are funny you just are funny I think you just need to be here's the thing that I coach people around is you know if you want to be something identify with that thing you want to be people want to don't you know what I say to people is if you say I, I want to lose weight your brain doesn't like here's my model of the brain your brain doesn't like a sense of loss so identifying with losing something isn't a great way to start your day everywhere every day but if you identify with what you want to be so if you want to write things identify with being a writer if you want to be a singer identify with being a singer rather than I'm um, identifying with writing impressive bits of work or singing amazing songs just identify with being the thing you want to be and do you know what if you just think about that long enough every day stuff starts to come into your space and it might start small 
and then it could explode big. But honestly, I never saw myself as a coach until I started to think, actually, I know I can help people. So I identify with helping people rather than being a coach. Yeah. I thought about being a menopause coach, but and I and I just thought, no, who would want to listen to me? I I can't I can't help it. That's it's ingrained in me, that sort of self deprecation that putting myself down lack of self-worth that is a result I do believe of PMDD I would agree with you I would agree with you because when we go through that hormonal change you spend a lot of time in your own head yes yes and you don't hear people you don't hear people paying you compliments you just say oh you're saying that because you're trying to be nice to me or yeah you're saying that because you yeah you feel sorry for me I think what starts to happen though is when you get the tools to unpack yourself and I know that sounds very flowery but if I said to you if you knew what all your strengths were if you knew what your values were if you knew where you got your confidence from that would start to turn down the dial the volume on that ghetto blaster which is blaring it's not you they feel sorry for you what starts to happen is you do start to believe your own magic because you see how it affects other people and I think that's maybe where your strength is Kate The camera, the pieces you do to camera don't reflect back to you how much of a difference you make to people. But I'm saying to you, the reason I wanted to get you on as a guest is I know just what a difference you make to people's lives. And you've been here for a long time. I know there's a lot of people coming through new, lots of mandates and various other things that people are talking about. But what has stayed fast and steady is the Make Menopause Matter campaign. And I think that maybe came into your life for a reason, because like you said, you're following the same format for PMDD represented. Yeah. You know? so, yeah. So, tell, so tell us before we finish today, where do you want that to be? I mean, in terms of signatures and, you know, what more can we all do to support you? Well, obviously, if you go to the um, if you if you follow um, PMDD represented on Instagram or on Twitter, um, you can there's a link there that will take you to the campaign petition. So as many signatures as possible is, is would be a great start. And then hopefully we want it to snowball like it did for Diane. And the more awareness there is around it, hopefully the, the more signatures we get and more pressure will go on to GPs actually being trained. Because that's what we want at the end of the day, GPs trained. So just awareness and I think the more women aware of it that actually go to their GP and and mention to their GP could it be this then the GPs might start thinking yeah well we actually do need to learn about this as well so it's not only helping the women with the with the condition it helps the GPs to to look into it themselves yeah um and you're so generous with your time is what I notice as well You're, you're always going in and doing talks and and various things to sort of keep raising that awareness and um you know you're one of those people who just keeps going I would imagine and even though we don't always see what you're up to you you are staying true to your own values which is about making this different for the other generations coming through um, yeah so what's what's your what's what keeps you motivated what keeps you in the game to keep going with I'll it I tell you what keeps you motivated my inbox my DMs, the amount of women that contact me, either with PMDD or menopause symptoms and issues with their GPs or, or getting treatments or, or getting their HRT, that's what motivates me. The amount of women that are still struggling. I, yeah. I, it's, I, can't, I can't bear it. It's no. not fair. It's just so wrong. It's, and, um, it, and, and obviously, as we know, we're just coming through this HRT shortage um which all seems to have gone very quiet all of a sudden yeah. I mean what's your sense are people still desperate are people still yeah, without the, at the moment yeah, the, people are still without 100 percent. yeah but these shortages aren't new these shortages no. have been around since 2019 it's nothing new it's not the Davina effect and all this it's just we there, there's no importance of getting the HRTs to the pharmacists for women that's what it is. Well, you know, it, it, is. you're absolutely right, because I worked in the pharmaceutical industry selling HRT. And the minute the Women's Health Initiative study came out, um, HRT fell off a cliff in that it was not deemed important because it's not monetarily. It wasn't going to bring any money yeah. in. Um, plus the fact that, you know, so many of these studies are all skewed. I mean, I'm part Asian. My mum's Sri Lankan. 
the Asian women experience menopause five years earlier than their than their white counterparts. You know, the studies and the data just isn't there, and therefore no. people don't want to invest in it. Um, no. It's because we're that, women, it's, and it's because we're women. And At the end of the got, day, that's got to change, hasn't it? That has got to change. Yeah, definitely. Where do you I think... do some? I was Sorry. Gonna say, uh, once a month, I well, every six weeks, I go to the hospital in Oxford and I do what's called um, uh, patient tutoring. So I talk to all the trainee doctors that are doing their gynecolo gynecology module, whatever they call it, module. Yeah. I don't know what they call it. So I have a room full of trainee doctors that look about twelve. And I talked to them about my experience um, when I went to the doctors with PMDD and with um, menopause. Really? And they, yes. And I spoke to the, the, the lady that runs the, the lecturer, said, oh, I want to speak to you after, last time I went there. And she said, oh, we're changing the curriculum. We're going to change it up a bit. She said, I'm actually going to add PMDD onto the curriculum. And, I, and it wasn't until I left and got home, I, thought, I felt like crying. Oh, what thought, an oh my god so that's oxford university hospitals will have pmdd on the curriculum for thanks their training to you. doctors thanks to you well i don't know about that but and so well, who else, who else has been thing. going in there no one else has been going in there and talking so that to me they, is they have got other um, patient tutors as well that some talk about endometriosis all sorts but to add it to the curriculum, I thought, oh, my God, at least these junior doctors are going to be aware of it, of her, uh, will have actually heard of it. Because they stop behind and speak to me and say they've never even heard of Amazing. it. Amazing. And it humanises it, doesn't it? I think that's the biggest criticism um, yes. generally. It humanises it. There's no, you can read about it in a textbook and it will evoke no feelings in you whatsoever. But if you hear a story from a person who's living with it, that touches hearts and minds. And for me, that's where you win people over. Like any good book, isn't it? If you win people's hearts and minds in a novel yeah. or a piece of writing, you've got them. I always say to them, what I want from, why I do this is because I want you to uh, see the patient and not the textbook. Excellent. And that's what I want you to see when I talk to you. When you leave here today, I want you to have seen a, a patient, a person. And, and if it doesn't suit, that person doesn't suit the textbook, you have to listen to them because they know their bodies. So yeah, sort of humanize it rather than textbook it. That's exactly oh, that's, what I that said. Is, that is brilliant. And so it's probably the best place to leave it. Yes, which grassroots is, again, we're going grass in. Grassroots supporters. Yes. There, there are more than enough campaigns, but you know what? If you're going to put your signature to something, put it to a campaign that's already running. It's already got that weight of evidence. It's also, also got the voice and the ears of the people who are the change makers, you know. So, you know, Diane is great at networking and she's networked with the right people as you will be doing with PMDD represented. You know how it works. That therefore makes your campaign really, really helpful. So please sign up to both of those, particularly the PMDD represented. They could do with your love, do with your voice, do with your signature. So we'll put those links out. But um, what's your hope for the future? If you have to think about one thing you'd want for women generally in the next five to 10 years, what, what would you want, Kate? I want the GPs trained. That, that yeah, I would just boom. be happy with that. I just want GPs trained in menopause and PMDD. And then if they choose to specialise in it, and I'd love more specialist clinics as well, so that when these women, you know, my daughter's 32, but she'll be going through menopause, my 14-year-old, I don't want women suffering anymore like, you know, I have. I don't want it. It really makes me want to cry. Oh, I we just don't want, want that. We don't want that because you, you're such a beautiful soul. We don't want you. We don't want any more tears shed than, than have already been shed. But... So from me to you, thank you so much, Kate, for giving me your time. I've so oh. enjoyed finally getting in the space. You're such a busy lady, but thank you for being generous with your time. And hopefully we can catch up again and see how the campaign's going. Keep supporting you because together yeah. we win, don't we? Yeah, we've all got to stay. If we all just stay and make menopause matter. It's, it's there, it's running. It's already, you know, accumulated low signatures. We just need to keep it keep that ball rolling really is all I can say on it definitely well thank you so much for your time today. thanks for having thanks. me you're welcome